Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Linguistics second series. Um, we are happy and delighted to um, have Professor Enam Alwer as our guest speaker this afternoon. Um, Enam is a good friend of Sora. She's been here many times. Um, she is part of a very lively Arabic linguistics community in the UK and worldwide. Um, and she just is, I guess, at the end of a Liebersjung funded research project. The beginning. Ah, at the beginning of the <laughs> research project, um, which looks at the formation of dialects, and in particular at, um, at dialects of Arabic. Um, and has field sites in Jordan and Amman, which talks about today about normativization and the hyper dialect further developments in the formation of the Amman dialect. Thank you very much, Lutz, <coughs> and thank you very much for the kind invite uh, again. And I apologize to those of you who may have read quite a bit about this because I've been working on Amman for some time now. So as Lutz said, uh, this is finally um, being completed. This is the third phase of it. Well, in fact, I am at the beginning of, of this project and I, I gave the main line in the title to something that I'm working on currently. So you won't hear very sophisticated analysis of that, I'm afraid. It's just, um, uh, I thought I wanted something, I, I wanted your thoughts really on what I'm um, at the moment analyzing. So in this talk what I'll do is I'll go through the project. So this is very much, as I said, work in progress, but there are very important results that help me, in fact, complete the project uh, at the moment. So the project started with a pilot study mainly. So I'll talk about the project as a whole, what it's supposed to do, what it aims to do. And I will recap on some of the findings. Some of you here, especially Hanadi, um, Chris, will know. Uh, uh, some of these features that have been analyzed, so I'll, I'll recap on some of the features. And along the way, I'll talk about a couple of features in details. And the reason I want to do that is to really link with the second part of the talk, the final part, namely this normativization that is happening in Amman. Uh, which brings me to the last part, namely post-formation. Now, I'm calling it post-formation um, only as a suggestion, really, that these processes probably happen after the focusing stage. So in dialect formation, we normally talk about diffuse stage, and it's not always necessarily the case that dialects go, on, uh, go through focusing afterwards. But if they do, like a man dialect has, we could witness some further developments which we see without being able to observe how it was formed in normal dialects that are hundreds of years old or thousands of years old. So if we think of English dialects, for instance, there's something uh, probably uh, that is prescriptive about the way people think about different dialects. So standard English, for instance, is thought about as being better. Than, than others. So what I'm trying to do here is really understand how this happens from the start. So I'm claiming that a case like this, where a dialect is being formed, uh, allows us to actually observe that happening, how the rules get set from the start. Okay, let me <coughs> kick off with a general description of, of this project. This is a study in new dialect formation, and what new dialect formation in the case of Amman means is brand new, clean slate. There is no previous dialect upon which this can be uh, this can build, which is currently in its third and final phase, I think, of being formed. Um, the research traces the formation of this dialect right from inception through stabilization, and we are on to the fourth generation really now. So it spans a period of about 80 years. And the framework of analysis, as some of you will be familiar with my work, is variationist paradigm as pioneered by William Lebov in his major uh, three works on the topic. And more specifically, 
I benefit from the work of Peter Trugel, uh, who in 1986 wrote a full-fledged book on uh, dialect contact and the outcome of contact, and also probably more so his work on New Zealand English. New Zealand English uh, so, uh, is a very good comparison, in fact, to many of the cases that we find around the Arab world. So here we had, in the case of New Zealand, we had migrants from various dialectal backgrounds interacting in a new social context, almost tabula rasa, clean, state, uh, clean slate, a new dialect emerges. And this is uh, the topic that is investigated in uh, Trugel 2004. Uh, the, the major importance really of that book is that it sets some sort of theoretical framework for dialect contact studies. Within the Arabic context in particular, the project in Amman is uh, quite unique and uh, hopefully will be a model for what can be done uh, around the, the so-called Arab world, where you do see very many cases of new cities with new dialects being formed. Now, Amman <coughs> is a new city in a sense and a very ancient city in another sense. It is only new as an Arabic-speaking capital of a political entity. It is, uh, as some of you may be aware, a very ancient location. Its history goes back to probably 12 centuries before Christ. Uh, but as an Arabic city, and this is something that even Ammanis themselves, Jordanians generally, do not think about. As an Arabic city, Arabic-speaking city, it is very new. And the reason it is new is that it was simply deserted. It was left uh, uh, derelict until the early years of the 20th century, from the 7th century, uh, well until uh, the early years of the 20th century. Virtually no one was there. But I must, I must uh, here mention that the very first, uh, if you want to call them indigenous population of Amman, in fact were the Circassians who arrived in uh, the later part of the 19th century and were settled in various places in the city. But in terms of, as, and the Circassians were obviously not Arabic speaking, but in so far as Jordan is concerned, this was not the urban center. This is. Uh, a, a place that was designated then as the capital of Transjordan, uh, which later on in 1946 becomes the Kingdom of Jordan. And therefore, because of that, it attracted migrants from everywhere. They flocked into the city uh, from other internal locations in Jordan, from various uh, urban centers and villages, as well as from elsewhere. So uh, the statistics here are a little bit fragmented, but what I have on the board uh, is quite reliable, um, in so far as we can tell. So by the 1930s, the city probably had 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, now imagine this, I found this, uh, statistics from uh, the Ottomans that claimed that at the turn of century a man had 5,000 Circassians. This must mean that, uh, the, uh, so this must mean that between the early years of the 1920, 1920, sorry, the, 19, the 20th century and 1930s, only about 5,000 Arabic speaking individuals were around. So by the 1930s, we have a figure of 10,000 people. And by 1946, about 65,000 uh, was the population of Amman. Now, the early migrants, it is important in contact studies to know as much as we can about the early migrants. These are the founders, if you like. Uh, as Peter Truggill has shown, for instance, that um, regardless of number, sometimes the founding population can have a very significant effect on what the dialect is going to be later on. So the early migrants constituted two groups. We know that the vast majority were economic migrants or civil servants who worked in, in the new state, and they came mainly from Jordan and Palestine, but there were also individuals from Syria and Lebanon, some of them merchants, others political activists, 
Syria and Lebanon then were still under French colonial uh, rule. So the uh, political activists, if you like, ran to a place where there was an Arabic central uh, government. So the early population, predominantly Jordanian, Palestinian, but also there is a Syrian element and the Lebanese element. The pre precise statistics about the numbers of each one of uh, uh, the, the, the number of individuals from each one of these groups is not available at all. Uh, but I was able to uh, reconstitute what it might have been like through ethnographic interviews. I'm fa fairly satisfied that wha when I say that these two locations in particular uh, were the most important locations from which the early population arrived, um, I feel confident about that on the basis of the data that I have collected. And the two locations are the city of Salt, uh, probably over 95% of those from Jordan, from within the East uh, Bank, came from uh, the city of Salt, which is just outside Amman, and from Palestine, from the city of Nablus. Uh, on the other side of the river. I think I have a map here, <coughs> so you can see Amman is there, uh, salt, written salt there, no one can agree on how it is written really, and Nablus towards the north, somewhere there, I can't see it, somewhere there. Okay, just uh, uh, some more details about the population, the population, uh, the numbers are very important. The largest population increase in the earlier uh, years in particular happened as a result of the two wars in the region, the, the major wars uh, uh, in 1948 and 1967. It is uh, estimated, we don't again have uh, reliable statistics, um, uh, official statistics I should say, um, uh, but Rumor has it, if you like, this is the number that is often uh, uh, quoted, that well over three million Palestinians were displaced, the vast majority of whom settled in Jordan during that period. M many more were displaced later on and continue to be. From the 1950s, the population increased like this. These are reliable statistics. Uh, from the Department of Statistics, and you notice that between the 1950s and 1990s, the population doubled more than 15 times. So we start with just over 100,000, 1994, nearly a million, and it gets uh, worse, if you like, in terms of the speed with which the population was increasing. So the latest uh, official consensus that we have puts the population at this in Amman, so uh, 2.5 with Jordanian citizens uh, plus 1.5 non-Jordanians, but people who live in, in the city, most probably from Iraq and Syria in particular, uh, which constitutes about 49% of the total population of Jordan, so almost half of the country's population are concentrated in the city. Um, and it is estimated that by, not, by 2025, the population of Amman will be six million. Okay. Now, against this demographic background, the important points really to bear in mind for a study uh, of direct formation uh, can be summed up uh, as follows. There is no geographically neutral variety of Jordanian uh, Arabic. So all speakers speak some sort of uh, local dialect, regardless of social class as well. Now, whereas in neighboring countries, the capital of the city tends to be the standard dialect uh, for that particular norm, Jordan never had such a linguistic center. So we talk about, for instance, uh, in the southern and central part of, of Syria, Damascus certainly is a standard. We talk about Cairo as a standard. We talk about Beirut as, as a standard. Baghdad also became a standard. But Jordan never had that linguistic center. So very often, it looked outside its borders for a linguistic center. Um, <coughs> Jordanians and Palestinians generally identify, so the, the, 
uh, when I say Jordanians and Palestinians, what I mean to say here is the majority of the population of Amman. So they generally uh, identify themselves with the original place from where their forefathers came. Uh, this is certainly true of the first and the second generation to this day. So if you ask them where you're from, even if they've always lived in Amman, so the second generation, very many of them were, were born in the, in the city. They don't tell you I am from Amman. They often cite the name of the village or the town, Jordanian or Palestinian, uh, from which their families come from. And very many of them go back to their home, hometown um, for family weddings or funerals, etc. So the attachment is still there. However, in the case of the third generation, a very important development, in my view, was that many in the third generation, and now we're on to the fourth generation, began to identify themselves with the city. So actually, they invented a new term that never existed, this term, Amani, by which they meant, if I can find it, by which they meant that they were native to the city. In my view, this uh, shows something very important, that as the dialect is forming, a community is formed. So both the community and the dialect are, be, are being formed together. So Amman is acquiring a native population, if you like, which will make it very similar, which will give it very similar status to the status of Damascus, let's say. <coughs> okay, and this represents a radical shift, in my view, um, in social ling linguistic patterns from a plethora of local varieties to a situation similar to what we find in Damascus. Okay, the project itself began with a, a pilot study very long time ago, in 1998, in fact, I started working on, on that. And the pilot confirmed these, I had a hunch that there was a dialect, a stable uh, dialect, and indeed the pilot study confirmed that this is the case, that this dialect is unique, that the native speakers of this dialect, who are the third generation, they are the ones who made the dialect, speak considerably differently from their fathers and from their grandfathers. And in, in this case, in the case of Amman, we still have access to the original dialects, which is very lucky in my case. In the case of New Zealand, it was probably more difficult. Uh, so I can always check uh, what's happening uh, in these places from which the forefathers uh, came. And the third generation certainly speak a unique dialect that is not the same dialect as the one that their families spoke. And the formation of this a uh, distinctive dialect is associated with stabilization in the population. If I wanted to make a guess, I would make a guess that it was probably made sometime between 1975 and 1990, something like that. That's when focusing probably uh, occurred. And that is because that is the only time in the life of the city where the population was more or less stable. Okay. <coughs> Uh, here are some provisos now for what, uh, what's to follow. So the data that I will be citing um, uh, comes mostly from West Amman. So the, this is a simple map uh, of the city. That's where the pilot study started. And that is because I also had the hunch that that's where the dialect is being made. The city is divided socially, uh, almost uh, sharply so between wealthy west side and uh, less wealthy east side of Amman. Uh, the pilot study started there, uh, but now as the project is being uh, carried out, so to completion, I have quite a bit of data from the east side now, about 40 hours uh, so far from the east side. And what I'm seeing uh, based on the preliminary analysis, very preliminary, I, I'm still collecting data, is that, in fact, the, uh, in the east side of Amman, 
the third generation behave very similarly to the second generation in Amman. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Uh, here are the generations. So uh, this is really uh, the sum of um, the, 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 the aspects, so the stages of the formation of the dye, which is based on empirical evidence. So here we see the first generation, and I had access to a sufficient number of speakers from the first generation. These are the ones who arrived in the city as adults, mainly in the 1930s. There are a few uh, before that. I think the oldest arrived 1926 or something like that. But the vast majority of them arrived in the 1930s. And these individuals speak the original dialect, very much the original dialect uh, of the places uh, from which they migrated. Nevertheless, and this is something that we expect, uh, you do find what Peter Truggill called rudimentary leveling. Even in the first generation, leveling starts to happen. And here are some examples of these leveling, the, the features that have been leveled out from the speeches of, uh, from the speech of the first generation from both backgrounds. So this is completely dead, this affrication of k. Um, that comes uh, that that is in uh, in, the, in the dialect of salt. So this is a traditional feature in the dialect of salt, and this is conditional affrication of care, mainly in the vicinity of front and high vowels. Uh, in Amma, it completely disappeared already from the first generation. You simply do not find it. It's leveled out from the Palestinian side. It, uh, uh, this extreme raising of, of a, which is marked. I mean, we notice that these are marked features. So uh, they're not only minority features. Uh, of course, saying minority or major majority depends on where we are. Uh, but generally speaking, they are minority features. Uh, so these very marked features get leveled out. Uh, so Palestinian very high raising of, of a for mbarih also disappears in the first generation. The same in this word, for instance. So se'a becomes sa'a, also disappears in, in the first generation. Very interestingly, uh, you may be aware that Jordan received new cohort of migrants from Kuwait in uh, the 1990s, in the aftermath of the first uh, so-called Gulf War. Uh, these items I am noticing appear in the speech of the th of the generations who came from Kuwait, uh, the younger generations, uh, which must mean that Palestinian dialects in diaspora outside Jordan, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon uh, are very much dialects in isolation. Uh, there are probably uh, good social reasons underpinning this. So we notice, for instance, um, especially until recently, that expats in the Gulf uh, kept themselves to themselves, if you like. They socialized with each other. They never really acquired the dialects of the places that, in which they live. They continued to speak their original dialects. Uh, and these original dialects that they continued to speak are much more similar to how the dialects used to be when their fathers or uh, or forefathers migrated to, um, for work purposes. So they're much more conservative. One example that I can mention is the Queen of Jordan. Uh, uh, she does not speak Amani. She doesn't know that, but I know that. <laughs> she has very many features uh, that, that are very old Palestinian features uh, that are still used in Palestine. But you don't find that in her generation in Amman. Okay, the second generation arrived <coughs> uh, with their parents either as very young children uh, or were born in the city. Now we can, uh, uh, we want to imagine how the situation was. So these Maya flock in the city, their kids then go to school together, they play uh, in the neighborhood together. So the second generation are exposed to a variety of diet. They're exposed to uh, a lot more variety of dyes. In the speech of this generation, you find a mixture of all types. Really, it is chaotic. In one of my articles, I called it chaos. 
Uh, and what I meant by that is that you find extreme degree of uh, variability, but it is not structured variability, if you like. It is chaotic in, in this sense. So you find a mixture of, these are the two most important uh, sounds really that distinguish between the urban Palestinian and, and local Jordanian, so you find both. You find interdental and stop being used at the same time. These are very important. These have been sorted out completely in, uh, in Amman. Uh, so the, the ones with on are non-Jordan, not not non-local. They're urban Palestinian as well as urban Syrian, urban L Lebanese. In the speech of the second generation from both backgrounds, you find uh, the, these are pronominal suffixes. So you find ku as well as kon, human as well as hon being used. And very importantly, in the second generation, we find a complication in the social linguistic situation. And what I mean by this is the emergence of new constraints on variation. In this generation, we start to see gender emerging as a very important constraint on variation. But the speech of this generation is identifiably either Jordanian or, or Palestinian. The third generation is a completely different story. Here, all of them were born in the city. They diverge quite clearly from the speeches of their parents and grandparents. And the mixture and variability that we see in the second generation is much reduced. There is focusing, so orderly linguistic behavior is established in the third generation, and stable usage of very many features. And if we want to characterize these features that emerge, some of them are fudged features, by which we mean a, a mixture, so the, the, the contact between urban Palestinian dialects and Jordanian dialects gave a, a, a rise to either new features, completely new features, or features that are intermediate between the two, really fudged features. And the social linguistic correlates in this uh, generation. This affiliation with the city Ammanin is uh, perfectly well established. And there is an agreement on what is Amman and what is not. Now, um, people who, who, uh, who speak some sort of dialect uh, take this for granted, right? Uh, so uh, if I ask you about the grammar of your dialect, you can immediately uh, say, uh, no, you can't say that in my native dialect. Yeah, You can't say that in uh, Cockney, you can't say that in uh, XYZ uh, dialect. In cases of dialect formation like this, uh, unless there is a dialect, native speakers obviously cannot say that. Unless there are native speakers of the dialect, obviously you don't get that. And indeed you do in Amman in the third generation. With confidence they tell you, you can't say that in Amman. Yeah? Which means that they have developed intuition for what is grammatical or ungrammatical in their own dialect. Okay, here is a summary of the features that I have uh, analyzed. And there are some that I should have listed here that are being analyzed. Most importantly, quantifiers are doing all sorts of interesting things in the city. Uh, so I'll just go through some of these. The, the vowels, in fact, I focused on the vowels to begin with because vocalic differences, vo vocalic features um, are very important, significant, um, salient features that distinguish between urban Jordanian, urban Palestinian and, and Jordanian. And, uh, uh, there's some sort of connected vowel <coughs> movement, perhaps starting with the raising of long A ah, and certainly the tongization of A e is uh, is happening. I, uh, I am yet to confirm with empirical data that this is connected, that this is a chain shift, really, but I think it might be. Now, the development that happened here, this is a very important feature. Uh, the feminine ending, some of you who, who may be familiar with, with Arabic, so uh, many nouns and adjectives end in a uh, in Arabic, and this a uh, can be realized either as a low vowel a. Uh, or as a raised vowel a, 
or sometimes the raising can be as high as E, as in Lebanese dialects. Uh, some dialects raise unconditionally, so uh, Iraqi dialects, for instance, are raised unconditionally. Uh, Jordanian, so Levantine dialects, generally raise conditionally. Uh, uh, either they, ra they raise conditionally or they lower conditionally. Uh, and the difference between the two types of dialects, even though they, the two types uh, are uh, raised conditionally, is that in one type, raising is the default feature. In the other type, raising, uh, uh, lowering is the default feature. And that is precisely the, the difference between Jordanian and urban Palestinian, even though both of them raise. And what I found in Amman is really astounding. <coughs> I call it a fudged form because the phonology uh, comes from urban Palestinian or Syrian or Lebanese, they're, they're all the same. But the phonetic quality of the raised vowel is Jordanian, is, is not uh, Palestinian. So it's almost as if they got the phonology from one place and the phonetics from another place. And this is not uh, ad hoc at all because for the, for the urban Palestinian uh, phonology, to win out, if you like, in this case, is not at all uh, surprising because it is identical to all other city dialects in the region. So this is the majority form, if you like, and we do expect majority forms to win in normal situations. Okay, so in the consonant, uh, so the ga'a, I will talk about it with some details in a, in a second. Um, because it's, it's rather important. So, Lutz, I didn't ask how much time do I, I have because I tend to talk a lot and I'm trying not to. <laughs> you still have plenty of time, so we have to leave the room by five. Don't worry, I won't keep you until then. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the interdentals certainly are probably disappearing. You still find, find them being used in Amman, also in the third generation and the fourth generation, but my guess, based on the statistics, is that they're on the, their way out. So, uh, th, uh, the and the will probably disappear in the future. And what I mean by lineation of j here in particular is that j uh, is becoming j, but in fact it is, it is further being fronted to something like z in the, what I call the hyper dialect. I'm not sure it has a chance of surviving that one, but uh, je is, is the one that is focused, so the fricative rather than the affricate. And there were features in the morphophonology that I also investigated. This feature, the um feature, kif hal kum, uh, was made in Amman. It occurs in other Arabic dialects, but in Amman it, it, is, it is actually uh, completely new. It did not, uh, does not occur in any of the dialects in the input varieties, if you like. Um, and uh, the conjugation of the third person masculine perfect verb, I won't go uh, through that, but I published an article about it. And I will talk with some details about this, the conjugation of two particular verbs. Um, we call them uh, so gloss stop <coughs> initial Hamza initial uh, verbs. Okay, uh, let's then look at a couple of examples from these features that have focused in Amman, and I intentionally chose one that is undergoing has undergone reallocation, and it is a famous one, it's a ger versus er, uh, so the velar versus the glottal stop. There's hardly any study from the region that doesn't talk about this variable. Sometimes I, I call it infamous variable, but in fact, there's important information to be gained from that. Uh, it is being reallocated, and here's what we mean in social linguistics by reallocation. Sometimes in the dialect contact situation, both variants survive the coinization process. So very often one variant wins over, kicks the other when one away, but uh, often what we find is that both survive for various reasons, but they do not survive exactly in the way that, uh, so uh, their pattern of occurrence 
in the new dialect is not exactly the same as a pattern of occurrence in the original dialect. So you tend to find sometimes grammatical reallocation and sometimes you tend to find social and stylistic reallocation. Just to give you one example from English, uh, so Peter Truggill for instance thinks that Canadian raising was probably a case of uh, reallocation. So in, in Canadian English you have raised a uh, after voiceless sound, so house, uh, but no raising after voice sound, uh, before voice sounds. So houses, but house houses. Yeah. So the, 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 and um, the explanation for that, at least one of the credible explanations for that, is that in fact, both arrived. The, the one with shorter diphthong, so the O and E, uh, probably from Scottish originally, and the other one was there. It's a case of dialect contact. Uh, so rather than the wide diphthongs, O and I, I uh, ousting the uh, shorter ones, that both survived in the new dialect in Canadian English, but were reallocated to specific linguistic environments. So in Canadian English, we find the shorter one after voiceless consonants, which makes sense, right? Uh, yes. Monique? Yes. <laughs> uh, whereas the wide one uh, used elsewhere. Okay. Uh, in the case at hand, this is the reallocation of G. You might have heard a lot about it. G is a, is a label. I mean, this is how dialects are, are actually identified in, in the region, in, in Jordan in particular. And the reason it is so salient is that there is something uh, that is different. Uh, so it's the G uh, uh, business, but in particular, G is associated with uh, uh, loads of social values. Uh, so it's, uh, some people think it is uh, rural, outdated, but at the same time it is an important symbol of identity. Others talk about it as being uh, uh, tough and therefore more appropriate for men. Uh, but recently I'm finding that girls are using it to fend off sexual harassment, for, in, for instance. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it's laden with social linguistic meaning. So what happened is the following. Now, just a little bit of background. Traditional Jordanian dialect, all of them have ga. There is no exception to this. Absolutely all of them have their, this, which is a regionally less dominant. Less dominant, yeah? But not necessarily, it's a localized variant, but not necessarily in the minority. In fact, if you... Uh, if you think of the region as a whole, the whole of South and a lot of Eastern Syria is uh, all uses this. And yet this has less dominance socially. And that is most probably connected with the fact that the city dialect, none of them has this. Uh, urban Palestinian has this, which is absolutely typical of all city dialects in the region, as well as Cairo. Uh, for instance, even though Egyptian Arabic really has no influence in, in Levin, on Levantine dialects. It, doesn't, it isn't involved in any social linguistic uh, processes. But in addition to this, uh, re, uh, to regional affiliation, whether you come from here or there, and hence your choice of the variant, these variants are associated, as I said, with a range of social values. Now, across the three generations, gender has a consistent effect, effect. But we know, we start to see that its effect increases in the following way. So in the first generation, remember I said, in the vast majority of cases, really, apart from these features that I talked about, they stick to their original diet. But already, in the first generation, we notice two particular groups diverging from their, the norm for their heritage dialects. And these are Palestinian men and Jordanian women. Already in the first generation, few tokens, about 5%, something like that, few tokens of G appears in the speech of Palestinian, urban Palestinian men. Where I, see, where I say PM here, where I say Palestinian, I mean urban. 
I don't have time to talk about rural Palestinian. Uh, so this is urban Palestinian. So these, uh, uh, these individuals who come, who speak normally dialects that have uh, uh, also used G in a few tokens. And Jordanian women who would have grown up in families who would have acquired dialects with G started use a few uh tokens. The other two groups, these are the most conservative groups, there's absolutely no variation. They simply stick to whatever they use as young children. In the second generation, suddenly we see women shooting up in the use of this app. Uh, and I think that is when this gender distinction started. So uh, very often you probably read about this. Uh, so A uh, is considered soft and G uh, is considered uh, uh, tough. Uh, of course, uh, linguistic features aren't endowed with uh, values like that. These are social values that have bases. And if you trace how these things emerge, uh, you always find something in the social hist history of the community that explains that. And in fact, this is, this is the case. And it, it probably, th this very sharp distinction in Jordanian that's in Amman probably started after the internal war, in particular in 1970. Uh, so here we find that the same groups diverge from the speech of their parents, exactly the same groups, the Jordanian women, the Palestinian men. The Palestinian men, in fact, here used about 50% of, uh, of, the, of Jordanian, the Jordanian tokens. So this stereotype that uh, people have in, in Amman and a stereotype that is talked about that G is tough and A uh, is, is soft, this is appropriate for men, this is appropriate for women, is based on usage. So if they hear more men using this and more women using that, then the correlation is established. But then of course we have to ask the more important question, why did this become associated, why did this become more attractive attractive to men, and why is that became? And that, the story of that is normally found in the history of the community. So if, if one carefully analyzes the um, social history of the community, you find the answer. And there is a story for this in Jordan. Uh, so in this generation, what we notice since these speakers, these diverging groups, are not using variants that are associated with their heritage uh, dialects. So what we find is that ethnicity is blurred. It doesn't go, nothing goes. Uh, what you find is that social constraints are layered uh, with different importance. So gender becomes more important, but ethnicity becomes less important. So these social constraints on variation are layers. Uh, nothing replaces nothing, in, at least in this case. Um, and for the diverging groups, there seems to be some sort of conflict. So based on usage, this is the conflict for the diverging groups. And the diverging groups are the Palestinian men and the Jordanian women. Uh, and the reason I say there is a, there's a conflict here is that their ethnicity uh, points in one, one direction, but their gender choices point in another direction. In the case of the men, uh, Palestinian men, their ethnicity, so dialectal heritage, that's what it means here, uh, points in the direction of the glottal stop of a, uh, uh, but their gender choices, so there's pressure on men to use G away from their heritage and vice versa in the case of the Jordanian women. In the third generation, there are two very important developments. So in addition to gender and ethnic affiliation, so remember in the first generation it was dialectal heritage, it was ethnic affiliation that really told you how the variation is structured very straightforward uh, type of structure of variation. In the second generation, a second layer is added, namely gender. And here, it becomes more complex. 
because you cannot predict simply by gender or simply by dialectal heritage. You have to look at the interaction of both. In the third generation, it becomes a lot more complicated. In the third generation, context and interlocutor become very important. They emerge as further constraints. And here, gender becomes a major organizing factor, such that the female speakers in the third generation and beyond predominantly, almost consistently, in public use the glottal stop. So there is almost no variation in the ca case of the woman. Uh, so in other words, what they do, they advance the trend that would have started by their grandmothers. Yeah? The grandmothers started to use a few tokens. It is very um, comforting for me to see that it is the men who are doing a lot more work with this variation for what? It is the men really in Amman who have to watch out for their tongues when it comes to this particular sound, not the women. The women use ah and that's acceptable, that's, that's fine. The men uh, are extremely variable, but there is an important structure. You can, you can predict how these constraints are layers. And, and these are observations from, uh, uh, from my research. So normally in group, in group uh, interactions, so they're interacting with their families, basically. They use their heritage variants. This is the, the men. Uh, if they interact with, with girls, if they're courting girl, girls in particular, or talking to very young children, they tend to use uh, Yeah, they tend to use the uh, other one. In ethnically mixed male interactions, especially if there are disputes, if there are fights. I, I'm very polite here, I call it disputes, it's fights, really. There are many fights uh, all over the city, all the time. You, can't, you do not hear a man fighting in A. Uh, they would take the mickey uh, out. Uh, so that's when you hear G consistently, absolutely. Um, and recently, and this is the one I'm analyzing uh, currently, type of employment is very important. You always find that where you have changes in the eco economy, uh, it is reflected in social linguistic patterning. And the new type of employment in the service sector uh, that brought uh, a wide sector of Jordanians into new types of employments in hotels, uh, so waiters, for instance, receptionists, <coughs> bank, uh, and the new type of shops, these transnational globalized stores. So all the shops you, you see in London, you find in Amman, all of these changes in the economy have repercussions on the social linguistic, uh, you know, on the social linguistic patterning. And that is because they create new linguistic markets for different linguistic features. So these new uh, types of employment, as some of the examples I'll show will, will demonstrate, uh, also influence the choice between G and D. So what we notice is that none of these social variables correlate with linguistic usage simple, in, in a simple way. It is a very complex structure of variation. So you cannot predict by relying on any of these uh, factors uh, uh, independently of the other factors. It is an interaction between all of these, and hence the value of quantification, really, in social linguistics. So the variationist model that we uh, work with would be able to pre predict, based on statistics, uh, who does what, when, and why, um, if we have enough data, of course. OK. And the second variable that I want to talk about, which is still not focused, uh, but is on, on its way of being focused. Now, the reason I chose this is that I am now able, in fact, to, uh, to say, which I wasn't a couple of years ago, that it looks like all of the input dialects were similar in the conjugation, in the first one. So the input was similar from both sides, from Jordanian and Palestinian. 
and similar and different here means one thing. Either you conjugate these verbs with an or type of conjugation of vowel or with an a type. Now, there isn't enough information about Palestinian that there isn't enough reliable information from Palestine, but together with the data that have been collected by my colleague Uri Khoresh uh, ha has been very helpful and helped us to in fact determine um, what variants were used uh, in which locations. And it looks to this day, uh, it looks like the only Palestinian city that doesn't have this pattern, with, that has this pattern with A is Hebron, Khalil. Uh, all others have or, despite what um, Bergstress, Bergstress in fact has Jerusalem, I think, with A, but I don't think it is. Uh, Gaza, the jury is still out on that. Okay, so there are two basic ways of conjugating these verbs, either by using an a vowel, so bakul, ptakul, ptakli, biakul, etc., which is exactly the pattern that you find in Syrian Lebanese dialects, um, as well as in Iraqi dialects, in uh, Egyptian dialects. In fact, this is the pattern you find everywhere, except in this, uh, in this particular area. Except in Jordan, Palestine, this very central area, there are there are a couple, and of course southern Syria, all of the all of the Horan that you find this same. Uh, the, the you find you don't find a, you find o, uh, and down in the southern peninsula, there are a couple of areas in Yemen that have been uh, quoted as all type of uh, dialects, as well as a couple of locations in Oman. So if you look at the distribution, that's what I'm trying to say. If you look at the distribution in Arabic dialects of where you get <coughs> this, uh, this pattern with all, they're isolated uh, areas nowadays and disconnected which is a strong suggestion that it might be a very ancient feature. That, so, so the fact that you find it in Jordan, Palestine, is disconnected, is not connected with its occurrence in Yemen or in, in Oman. I'm still not quite sure where it came from. There were suggestions, so we looked at the at, uh, possible Aramaic connection, it doesn't, seem to be successful. Uh, uh, th there is no conclusive evidence, but it looks not, uh, not from Aramaic. But in any case, so this is the, uh, so the input varieties have this O. Uh, so instead of bakul, it's vocal, ptokel, or vocal. Uh, there are very many, here is a range of variation uh, in the conjugation of these verbs, no less than 24 forms, instead of six or seven. 24 forms are available and are used, in fact. And the same is true for the second one, for the verb to take. All of these forms are available. And you notice that there are more forms in the third uh, singular masculine, and the reason that there are more forms here and one, one more here, so in the third person pronouns, is that in Amman, y, uh, with y or without y is also variable. So the yod, either with yod or without yod, is, is also a possibility. And that is because other verbs, ordinary verbs, uh, can be conjugated with or without yod. So in the case of third persons, you have a further possibility with or without yod, and hence the more uh, forms available. Okay, here are the results for the analysis of, of this. Uh, this is, I think, the 39 speakers, something like that. Um, and this is all the variants, uh, sorry, this is the whole uh, sample together regardless of ethnicity or age. So you see already that in the first person, the all forms are in the minority. So, uh, and this is, this is 
extremely interesting because what you see here is not only uh, uh, increase in the use of the new form, but you see it being structured in the paradigm in a specific way. So it disappears first from first singular, followed by whatever. So there is clearly a route that it is following in, uh, in, in the case of A, in its introduction in the system, and the route through which the O is making an exit through the paradigm. If we now look at, and here you will start to see the importance of these different constraints that I talked about, ethnicity, uh, context, uh, uh, ethnicity and age in particular. So if we look at these in the third generation and age, in the third generation in particular, immediately you see more blue, right? And the blue, so if you look at this one and then look at this one, you see more blue. The blue is the air form. So immediately you notice that the air form in the third generation is being focused. So the O form is being shunned, the air form is being noticed. And then if we look at ethnicity, even in the third generation, you still see that it, it, there is an influ the influence of something as basic as dialectal heritage. Now these kids, kids, they're in their 40s now, some of them in fact, uh, have never lived in the places from which their grandparents uh, migrated. And in the case of many of them, even their parents never lived in, them, in, in those places. And yet, the effect of home, the dialect at home, um, shines through. Uh, it still shows. It didn't show, it doesn't show, for instance, in, in Ga'a. It doesn't show in, in Qum. Both groups just use Qum regard, regardless. But it shows in some value. So here, in the way in which it shows is that what you can conclude from this is that it is those with, with Palestinian heritage who are in the vanguard of this transition from O to A. Now, we don't know why. Uh, it may be that this transition actually from O to A started to happen in Palestine, so already their grandparents had some tokens of this. And so they already had more input in their childhood uh, than those with Jordanian heritage. So those with Jordanian heritage would never have heard at home the air forms. Okay. Uh, and the same is true for uh, for Ahad. Let me just uh, point out something. Now, the final thing that I wanted to say about this feature. So clearly, I, I mean, I am anticipating that Amman is moving in that way. But it's moving in that way. Again, this is not ad hoc. Uh, similarly to the feature that I talked about earlier. The fudged form, the feminine ending, where I said it's not an ad hoc choice. The choice of the phonology of urban Palestinian is not ad hoc when we consider that the, all other city features, uh, all other city dialects in the region uh, do exactly the same thing. And contact is plentiful between these cities, and cultural cohesion is there as well. So, they do identify as a cultural unit, if you like. Uh, this is also, so th this shows that regional colonization also has a role to play. So it's not only what happens in that locality, but also what happens in the region. So there is, at some level, pressure from the region, pressure from dialects that are uh, politically outside uh, the country in question, if you like. Which, if you think about it, this is probably what gives a regional dialects a, a, the distinctive flavor that they have, right? So if we, if we talk about the north of, west of England or the northeast, um, or if we talk about Australian English, or if we talk about Moroccan Arabic uh, and Levantine Arabic, uh, so whereas the, the 
the native speakers of these dialects don't think that they speak like each other that much as much as outsiders think. But why do outsiders actually have that impression? Um, the reason they have that impression is, is that there is such a thing as regional coinization. The region that, so I am taking, for instance, in Morocco, which I, fi I find extremely funny, uh, people think I am Lebanese. And, and to me, this is extremely funny <laughs> because, because I, I speak traditional Jordanian, for instance. But of course, to them, it, the features, the salient features about Levantine dialects uh, are, uh, are different from the ones that I think are salient to identify me as Jordanian, for instance. Okay. And the last thing that I want to talk about, which is supposed to be the uh, so, which is, which is really the topic that I wanted to bring in uh, the totality of the results that I've obtained so far, which is something that uh, literally I started noticing about three, four months ago, but have had some field notes about. And these sorts of data uh, do not come from recorded interviews. So, these are the uh, field notes that occur very naturally, so situations that you come across as you're doing field work. And one uh, that I thought might be some sort of normativization, in fact, hyperdialect might be some sort of normativization as well. And it is something that I thought is probably post formation, uh, something that happens after the uh, dialect has, sta has been focused. There is a, a new dialect. Now, what I mean by normativization, I must admit I don't like uh, words with ishin and isms, but you, sometimes you cannot uh, avoid them. So this Asian uh, word, what I mean by it is a stage in standardization where in certain contexts, and I, I'm very careful to say in certain contexts because the data that I have come from certain contexts, the norm and values associated with it acquire the status of a prescriptive standard. Uh, so basically telling you how to speak. Uh, how does this happen? Now, in my readings, in, in sociology, of course, normativization is, is something that sociologists have analyzed quite intricately. Um, and, and you also find analysis in philosophy. Uh, so, uh, one of the definitions that I thought are uh, quite apt for the situation that I have uh, is by someone whose name I can't say properly in front of you, so uh, Jedlikowska, probably. Uh, so she says, the term denotes the supply of a range of desirable ways of thinking and behaving, which ensure that the shaping of reality is made subject to certain standards. And she further um, elaborates on that by citing a, a project, project um, about the uh, underlying the, the concept normativity, how it is seen as having two meanings, uh, one meaning which explains, ontological meaning basically, which explains to us how all rules exist, why we think something is pretty for instance, so all social rules have how they all exist in the first place, but also which is what I am really interested in um, currently now in order to un interpret the data that I have, the epistemological um, meaning, namely the criteria and relationships underpinning action and judgment. So precisely what leads to this particular situation. So in the case of dialect, so normative dimension, of course there is normative dimension of how we speak, but also there is normative dimension of how we dress, uh, what we think of food, how we perceive um, beauty, uh, etc. So what I'm interested in of course is the, the normative dimension of a dialect which tells us basically how to speak. You mustn't speak like that, you speak like that type of thing. And here is uh, some of the situations that I uh, recorded. This one is actually unique, whereas the second situation is not all that unique. I've come across it very many times, but in this case with these girls, 
And here it is women who are involved. I call them girls because uh, they were in their 20s, some, uh, something like that. So basically what, uh, what happened is that I was shopping and I shop uh, as, as part of my field work. So uh, it, as, as it happened, so I, I went into a, a, a store. In fact, it's an English store. Uh, so and, and there was the, uh, two shop assistants. One of them helped me for about an hour or something like that. Uh, and I sp I speak traditional Jordanian, so I don't speak. Uh, I speak with gut, if you like, which is very strange in Amma uh, and should be salient. Should people should notice that, and indeed many do. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that one would have expected that this young woman would have noticed how I speak, but she consistently spoke with, uh, with how girls are expected to speak in Amman. And this happened as I came to Peso at the cashier, her colleague was next to her. Um, so she started, she was wrapping my glassware and she whispered to her colleague, uh, saying this, how I hate wrapping glassware. Now, the way she pronounced glassware, which is gazaz in the traditional Jordanian dialect, in the Amman dialect, is supposed to be azaz with, with glottal stop for, for a woman, but she pronounced it with ga, and that was the first ga that she used in our interaction. But she wasn't talking to me, she was talking to her friend. I immediately heard that. Uh, the social linguists always interfere, don't they? Uh, <laughs> So, and she, she turned to me and said, are you paying by, by visa, madam? Uh, so I, I, I actually asked her that. I, I felt I could ask her that because we'd been talking friendly and she'd been helping me and everything. So I simply asked her, why did you speak with your colleague in an accent different from the accent you used with me? Uh, and her answer was because a woman customer uh, previously told her off for speaking with Gap. She, she was actually told off in, in the place where she worked by a woman. And uh, then I said, what did she say, say to you? So that woman apparently said this, beware of speaking like this again. She, she told her off. Uh, women don't speak like this and it isn't nice for them to speak like this. And can you imagine how, how uh, um, how strong these stereotypes are and how strong the normativization is. Uh, I mean, she's telling a total stranger who's helping her in the shop uh, how to speak. Yeah, and I, I have some, yeah. some question time. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I'll wrap up, I think, probably 10 minutes tops, perhaps five. Maybe. Just because I'm sure people okay. have lots of questions. Yeah. Because it's so much interesting stuff. And Thank you. Have to leave five. Thank you. So, uh, and what did you reply? I, I started to get angry, in fact, I was fuming. But of course, you have to uh, keep uh, distance from this. And, and what did you reply? She said, I apologized. Uh, and I said, why, why did you apologize? And at that point, in fact, her, her friend interfered. And she said, we were afraid she'd complain about us. It turned out that both of them, in fact, come from dialectal heritage, where they speak at home with Gab, but they were both told, uh, told off uh, by this woman. So I've been urged to, uh, this is men. So that was women. This is a, at another store, quite uh, upmarket, and I'd been interacting. I went there over a period of three weeks. Uh, I did. Um, buy lots of things and uh, uh, as well as collect uh, some data so th uh, so this this young man helped me uh, a lot over the uh, three weeks so I was able to actually and he was speaking out with me throughout the reason I said they must have noticed how I speak in fact they don't the stereotype is so strong that they don't notice that they needn't do that with me in particular, but they still do it. This is how strong normativization can be. So this one, I actually asked him, uh, the, oh, 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 who is your tribe? So about the name of his family. And he told me that, and I, I, Jordanians know where families come from. So I was able to, uh, he's, he's East Jordanian, so he's Jordanian. 
And I actually asked him that he, he speaks to me that way, why do you do that? And do you do, do, you do that at home? And he said, no, at home I, I speak X dialect. He named his dialect. But here I speak Adi. Now it is, very, it is not easy to understand what normal means. It is something like conventionally. And this is another aspect of what is happening to this dialect. So it is becoming a stand, the conventional way of talking, so to speak. So for him, the, the normal, the norm, is not how he spoke at home, but the norm is how he should be speaking there. Uh, OK, so I'll, I'll skip that. And now, at the same time, what one notices in Amman is some sort of a hyper dialect, and by which I mean very much what Labov uh, meant, sorry, there's an extra E there, uh, by hyper correction, so overshooting, if you like, or exaggerated use of certain features. And these are the ones that I was able to record. Now, interestingly, uh, and these features are mocked by native speakers of Ammani, they're actually mocked. So they talk about women who speak like that as being some sort of wannabes, some sort of, you know, wanting to show off. Now, interestingly, uh, one of these features was investigated by Hanadi in Damascus. And in fact, so a lenited uh, R, so R becomes almost an approximant, uh, so the normal R is, is a tap, probably. Uh, so R becomes a R or something like that. But what Hanadi found was that it was change in progress in Damascus. So, and it was used uh, by all social classes, but, but it was also used by the middle classes. Whereas in Amman, it is mocked. It is not something that, uh, that is uh, progressive, if you like. And this heavy uh, aspiration or palatalized stops is something that um, Nilufar Ha'iri talked about in Damascus, and she did make the difference, the distinction between slight palatalization and heavy palatalization. And in fact, Hanadi has um, also data from Damascus that shows that uh, that is also happening in Damascus. We don't know the social status of these yet, but in Amman, I am guessing heavy aspiration or heavy palatalization is also stigmatized. Uh, so. I have just short recordings here. Where are they? Oh, here. Uh, yeah. So let me just play to you. And the interesting thing is that features of this hyper dialect are actually used by speakers from all backgrounds, not, not particular backgrounds. So these, this one, for instance, is a guest speaker. Uh, so if you listen to how she pronounces uh, the, the bits that I've highlighted there, so this is actually an emphatic, originally. So this is, this is the word for Palestinian. So it should be ta, uh, but the way she pronounces it is t. Uh, and uh, she aspirates the d uh, there. And in this one, in the, second, uh, in the second one, what you will hear is actually almost African. It's not that African. But very heavy palatalization. This is the word for Catholic, basically. The word for Catholic is Latin uh, in Jordanian Arabic. So the way she says it, Latin, or something like that. So let me just play these quickly. <laughs> so uh, you also heard her use the English word pure. This is, uh, this is also a feature of the hyper dialect. Uh, I'll just play this. Again. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Gremlins. Okay. Here's the second one. Uh, Do you hear that? Lachin. Um, now, Compare this to, here I have little clips from mainstream Ammani. And the young woman here is from very similar background as the one you've just heard. So this is the word Palestinian, that's the same word up there. Ah. This is what happened, ah, oh, okay. 
Can you hear that? So it's Palestinian with ta. It's not no longer t. Oh. And if you listen to this, heard the difference. Okay, I'll stop this. <laughs> Sorry for talking so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very rich presentation, lots Thank of you. research findings and examples. The floor is um, open for comments or questions. Um, if you want to. Shop. I was curious about the, that, that story in the shop that you mentioned first with the, with the two female um, sales assistants. I was wondering whether you asked them um, about the background of the person who told them off. I didn't. Right. Um, but I mean, that, that's an important question, probably. I don't know whether they would have known, mm, yeah. but my guess is that it was a woman who spoke with A, of course, unlike them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, nice question. Mm. I, uh, I, had a, I had a question on exactly the same thing. I mean, I, I, I'm wondering, you know, do you think the, the customer, the kind of unpleasant customer, was she... She's horrible. What do yeah. you mean unpleasant? <laughs> <laughs> Do you, do you think she was? Um, do you think all she was doing? I mean, I'm asking about her motivation. Do you think her motivation was purely like policing femininity, or is um, was she perceiving the, the the shop worker as rude, like taking taking a rude tone or a rough tone with yeah. her or something? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for for asking that, uh, Chris. It's a very, very important. And in fact. Uh, one of my friends, whom I told the story immediately after it happened, uh, said something as kind as you said. Maybe she was trying to help them, <laughs> basically. Mm. Uh, it's a very important question. Very, um, we don't know. The answer is we don't know. I mean, this needs uh, further analysis. But uh, there are important observations, uh, as well as questions. Would she have done that to a young man? I doubt it. Uh, I doubt it, but that's, that's only my intuition. So gender has something to do with it. Would she have uh, done it, um, uh, you asked about her origin. I mean, my guess is that she was not local Jordanian. Would she have done it had she been one? Uh, now, on the answer to, to my second question on the basis of other types of data, I think not. Because what I heard, what uh, in other situations, uh, because I myself do that uh, all the time, is, uh, and of other girls now who are using the old dialect again, is praise from the locals. But all of these, um, the, all of these questions are important. I agree, totally. I, I was just wondering, you know, now that they speak differently, let's say a young woman or a woman at home and when they find work, do you have an idea of which one will sort of win? Will they always use both if they are outside the workplace and inside the workplace? Or at one point, the, the sex or the job will sort of win in yeah. terms of the dialect? Yeah. yeah, of course it's very difficult to predict in the case of uh, language change, what is going to happen. But based on, for, for instance, my experience as a Jordanian, when uh, uh, very many of my friends became bidialectal, so you and, and continue to be, so using one dialect at home and another uh, outside home. And normally, it's the one outside home that eventually wins out. And this is what happened really here. Uh, but whether this situation, so these these young women, for instance. They're beyond uh, the stage of acquisition, right? So they are native speakers of the other one, of their traditional dialect. They may or may not be native speakers of Ammani. But what we can anticipate on the basis of what has happened <coughs> is that their children are very likely to become native speakers of Ammani. Uh, and maybe there will be a generation where their children will also acquire, the children will also acquire the uh, original dialect as well as this. 
Now, if you look at what's happening elsewhere, I'm looking at this question, in fact, there is discrimination at home from very young age. <coughs> so, uh, as soon as they start school or something, people even speak to the girls differently from the boys. So you end up with a situation where the boys actually acquire, can, if they need to, can uh, speak the local dialect, but the girls can't, mm -hmm. even if they wanted to. Yeah. Because I was just wondering, this, this, this assistant, the, the, the person who was at the shop, I mean, you know, they were ashamed, so they said, you know, they thought that she would complain. So then I suppose that if they have a little girl at home, yeah. maybe they will want to prevent the little That's girl right. to go through the same That's right. deal, and then they will sort of influence the, That's that, right. that was the yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I came across exactly the same thing in my research in 1987. A mother said to me, that because her daughter spoke differently from the boys, and that was uh, outside a man even insult. She said she said that she speaks to the girl differently because this is nicer for a girl. Mm -hmm. So even at home, she spoke to her to her. Mm -hmm. But yes. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, earlier when we were talking about the kind of uh, difference between the way that people do their hands, and so the men do the girl and the women do the rock stop. And you said there was a kind of history or a story behind that, but you didn't say what the history of the yeah. story was. Yeah, 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 because it's uh, uh, rather complex, but there is all the history. In the case of um, in, in, in Amman, in Jordan, generally speaking, so uh, I think 1970 was a, a turning point, very important turning point. Now, um, uh, let me um, try and recall this argument concisely. So, uh, if you think about it this way, Jordan didn't have a linguistic centre, but not only that, it's always been considered by the surrounding countries as being less urbanised. So, almost automatically it had less prestige. So as soon as there was contact or exposure, there's always been exposure, so the others were more dominant. So people started acquiring, especially women, started acquiring the new way of speaking in, in particular. But I think what was also happening, men didn't to a large extent, but I think also what was happening is that um, women were excluded from the workplace. So there were only 16% of women who worked. So it's men who, if you like, benefited from the values of the other one. But in any, in, in any case, so it was women who introduced it in the community. And women do, oh, I mean, I haven't investigated this, but it just stands to reason uh, to expect that if the women are doing this, and based on what we know from other cases of language change, a change is likely to succeed. Because they interact with young children much more frequently. So, had it remained that way, probably the Jordanian one would have been a lot weaker than it is today. I don't think it will disappear. But what happened in 1970 in particular, there was an internal war, if you like it, which was perceived as a war between indigenous people and non-indigenous people. Uh, and uh, in the aftermath of that, and this is, uh, this is something that one can, um, can, find, can find very easily, you do tend to find that there was a strategy on the part of the state to include Jordanians in development, so indigenous Jordanians in development. So suddenly you, you see a lot more Jordanian men in political power and in the army. So the Jordanian accent acquired new dimensions, acquired the meaning of being local, <coughs> authentic, from a large tribe, and man, and have power. All of these, so women were excluded from that as well. So they continued to be influenced by other things. And I think that is when there was increase then, when Palestinian men started to adopt. Jordanian ga, that's when the real gender divide started. When, so people from all backgrounds started to use the same variables, uh, sorry, variants. I was just wondering, Imam, about um, the, so the second generations and the third generation men, the ones that do sort of half-half, 
Uh, uh, Palestinian men. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, and, and Jordanian women. Yes, yes. Um, are there are there like kind of uh, linguistic, purely linguistic factors that are relevant? Like you know, it strikes me that if you're kind of a lot of this is is um, it's kind of at least semi-conscious or more than semi-conscious. You're trying to project a certain image, and you know people might do that more successfully in some areas of the lexicon, for example, than others. I don't know, like. Uh, people sometimes people call it they call it ga, but sometimes they use the verb gal or an or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it that verb in particular it's very closely attached to. But then you you know I could imagine with kind of you know less high frequency items, uh, people might find it harder to perhaps deviate from their local variety or something. That's I right. I just wonder if you. Can say yeah, the about. analysis yeah. is is now um, being refined that way. But right. you're absolutely right, absolutely. So, uh, because uh, commonly occurring words <coughs> are, do behave differently, but there are words that are not subject to variation at all. Right. So there are names, for instance, Agab. No one says Agab, regardless of what background. Mm. There are special expressions, so Begalit, uh, which means disgusting. Mm. You don't hear in with a, and and speakers tell you it sounds dirtier. It sounds you know more effective with g, and there are speakers in the third generation who even adopt affirmation. They put it on if they're fighting or if they want to express uh, you know particular particular emotion about this and that, and so on. But this this level of analysis I think is necessary. But you're right, absolutely. But it's the same story with Qa and Da in Syria as well, where rural and... Yes. Uh, and um, I don't know if it dates back to the accumulated um, knowledge of, of these societies, of, of communities, of Khaldun and its division of... You know, but because it, whether it's Qa, Ga or A, Qa or A, we still have more or less the same gender dynamic. Yes, yes, it, I think so. I think so. Well, I think the Syrian case, um, so like your region in particular, is, is a lot more interesting, not a lot more interesting, but even more interesting, because there, if you look at power uh, as it correlates with which variant, actually it's the other way around, isn't it? So in your region, the Qa varieties, and at the same time, this is the standard variant. So the Qawr um, dialects are associated with the party in power. Dominant. Exactly, with the it's dominant it's social. social. Absolutely. And, and yet, socially, it is, it is stigmatized, the Qawr, or something. I think, I think this, is, this was probably my, my impression, subject to change maybe in the yeah. past few years. But Could be, yeah. It, uh, it has witnessed different sort of. Um, yeah, phases. So you might have your 1970, mm -hmm. which is what happened in Jordan, in fact, exactly. But I mean, I was just like questioning um, or thinking rather about the um, the ways that people acquire these norms in terms of normatization. Yeah, I know it's a horrible um, word. Rather than um, in prescriptive, direct verbal prescriptive rules, but rather the set of acquired. Absolutely. Um, these, are, these are extremely important questions and uh, thanks for bringing them up. Because at the same time as this happens, this is only the end result. I mean, for someone to feel comfortable enough to come up to someone to say that, it must have been almost the end process of normativization. So, for instance, if you look at soap operas, if you look at TV programs, co comedy shows, very often those who speak with girl have broken teeth, they're ugly, they're dirty, um, uh, they're not sophisticated, blah, blah. And of course, this works on the subconscious, of course, over the years and decades, and this is what we see is the end result of that, definitely. Um, I think on that we have to um, end the session. Please join us for a little bit at the Institute of Education. Uh, but first, thank you, Enam, again for one of Thank you.